Many of you found the video on the supplement NAC helpful and requested some more videos looking at other nutritional supplements. One of the most commonly requested has been quercetin and like NAC it has been disappearing off the shelves recently as awareness has been raised among both the public and possibly those pesky regulators. In this video I'll talk about why we need quercetin and what situations it might benefit us, whether it's worth taking supplements at all and ways to increase your intake through diet. This video covers a topic which is unlikely to be subject to any YouTube restrictions, however not all of my videos can appear here, so if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my Odyssey channel so we don't lose touch. As of October 2021, around 30,000 people are on board and the link is in the description below. What is quercetin? Quercetin is part of the flavonoid family, a class of compounds that are yellow in nature. They are found extensively in plants and produce many of the bright colours that are seen in flowers. The absorption in the gastrointestinal tract is said to range from 0 to 50%, which is a big range of course, and something to keep in mind if you are buying expensive supplements, as sometimes not much might make it into your body. We'll get into the reasons for that in a minute. However, ingestion with high fat foods may increase the absorption, which would please my friend Professor Tim Noakes. Tim is an advocate of the high fat and protein low carb diet and you can check out my interview with him. It has been long known that fruit and vegetables are important parts of our diets and of course nutrition scientists like to find out which particular constituents are providing the benefits. Because quercetin is one of the most abundantly found flavonoids in plants, they have been of particular interest. However, just because a food has a high concentration of quercetin does not mean that it is the best source for you because it exists in different forms and the absorption into your body of these different forms is variable. And here is where we need to talk about the chemistry a little because when people talk about quercetin they are sometimes referring to different things and food sources quercetin is usually glycosylated which means that it is bound to a sugar molecule and has a different name. There are numerous variations in the way the sugar molecules can be attached and one of these compounds is called rutin which you may sometimes see mentioned alongside quercetin. However in many supplement formulations you get what is pure or free quercetin as it is in the aglycone form, meaning without a sugar molecule attached. Unfortunately, although the pure form may sound good, the absorption is not so good. In fact, some studies found that the bioavailability of pure quercetin is so poor that it couldn't be detected in the blood even after a very high oral dose. In other words, you may just be ending up with very expensive poo being flushed down the toilet. That's not to say that some of it won't get into your body as it could be metabolized and absorbed because the free form doesn't circulate in the plasma. But data still suggests that it is very poorly absorbed compared to the natural glycosylated forms. So if you're going to take a supplement, you need to check what form it's in and be very wary that it may have limited absorption if it's in the pure form. What are the benefits of quercetin? Because of the limited absorption of free quercetin, ascertaining its benefits gets a bit tricky. Experiments showing the antioxidative and free radical scavenging properties have been done with quercetin in vitro. That's in a test tube. So we have to be careful about drawing conclusions about a molecule that does not circulate in the body in the same form as the one that has been tested in the lab. However, in this case, the test tube experiments may not be completely useless. Although free quercetin may be poorly absorbed, it is still going to come into contact with the walls of the gastrointestinal tract and therefore may have some effects on superficial cells without getting much further into the body. Experiments with colon cancer cells in the lab have shown that quercetin does have effects, at a molecular expression level at least, that indicate an anti-tumor effect. There also have been experimental rodent studies that showed quercetin had a fairly potent effect in decreasing the presence of precancerous lesions. Whether this can be translated into real world results in humans as a potential therapy or preventative agent remains to be seen as far as I can ascertain. 
Other studies have looked at the potential benefits for colon cancer through dietary sources of quercetin. These have included case control studies comparing the diets of those who remained cancer free with those who developed cancer. The authors noted that the highest quercetin intakes were in females, non-smokers, college graduates and non-African Americans. Keep in mind here we are not talking about taking quercetin in its free form but various glycosylated forms found in nature, particularly in fruits, vegetables, black tea and some herbs. The study found that increased quercetin in these dietary forms was associated with a lower incidence of colon cancer, although this was only when it was provided from fruits and vegetables and not with black tea. That actually had an increased incidence of distal cancer. Keep in mind that these dietary studies are complicated by the fact that there are multiple variables at play, many of which cannot be controlled. I'm aware of other reported benefits of quercetin, but the studies are not necessarily looking at the free form found in many supplements. During coronamania, there has also been interest in the use of quercetin to treat the Cerveza sickness. Now, as I pointed out in my NAC video with regards to whether it specifically treats this condition, my thoughts on this matter can be found in my video pointing out the problems of what clinical condition we are actually talking about. A PCR test can't guide us about what to do next. It really depends on what symptoms the person has and what needs addressing for that particular situation. There are papers such as this suggesting that it could be useful for the condition. However, if you review the references regarding purported antiviral mechanisms, we see that the virologists are up to their old tricks again. The studies all involve fake proxies such as tissue cultures, measuring nucleic acid and protein concentrations and alleged viral enzyme activity. None of these indirect measures require the existence of viruses, so calling it antiviral is bogus. Forget about phantom viruses, quercetin is giving your body the benefits directly as nature intended it to. How do I supplement with quercetin? You really need to consider whether taking the supplement is worthwhile and it is highly dependent on your usual diet. It is relatively easy to get adequate amounts through food and I'll talk about that in a minute. However, if you know that your diet may be insufficient or you feel unwell and you may need a boost for a period, there are certainly many formulations available. With regards to pure quercetin, a typical amount to take is 500 to 1000 milligrams a day and often the capsules come in doses around this size. As mentioned earlier, the absorption is very poor but may be enhanced by taking it with high fat foods. Toxicity of quercetin is rare and you'd probably have to ingest quite a lot to cause problems. The most common effects being gastrointestinal such as stomach aches and heartburn which are worse if it is taken on an empty stomach. Most drugs are not thought to have significant interactions with quercetin, although there are a few exceptions and you should discuss it with your healthcare provider if you are taking blood thinners, some antibiotics or chemotherapy. It should be noted that these medications will be affected by changes in dietary intake of flavonoids as well. What are the best dietary sources? Okay, with regards to the best natural sources, as mentioned, you are really looking at fruits and vegetables and some of the best are capers, which have extremely high concentrations, although obviously are usually only consumed in small quantities. Yellow and red peppers, red onions, red grapes, apples, although whole apples have much more than apple juice. Tomatoes, although it's found almost exclusively in the tomato skin. Blueberries. Acai berries, which I don't think I've ever seen in New Zealand. There seems to be a few smear articles about the berries on the internet, which makes me curious as to whether there's something going on there. Herbs such as dill and oregano and tarragon are also potential sources. Buckwheat is an alternative source with buckwheat tea being traditional in the Orient. Buckwheat is also used to make gluten-free flour and more recently to make gluten-free beer. There are also many other sources of course and I'll put a link in the description for the US Department of Agricultural document with almost 100 pages detailing the flavonoid content of various foods. So after all that, what do I do personally in my household with regards to quercetin? 
I don't generally take it in a pure supplement form due to the issues as discussed with regards to absorption. It's also because I have a diet high in onions and colorful peppers, as well as homegrown tomatoes and apples. And although I haven't confirmed this in a laboratory, I suspect the homegrown crops are packed with quercetin-related flavonoids, as they certainly pack a punch. In summary, in the typical supplement form, this is not a compound that I believe has the same sort of power as N-acetylcysteine or NAC. You can check out my video about NAC and learn how that boosts glutathione, your body's most important detox compound. Keep the conversation going in the comments and let me know if there are any other dietary supplements that you would like me to make a video about. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, Please support my work on Subscribestar, link is in the description. So that we don't lose touch, please find me at drsambailey.com and sign up for my free newsletter.